So good evening, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm very pleased to moderate this panel um, about the world in 2030. Uh, my name is Philippe Monnier. I'm from Switzerland and Mexico, but I grew up in Japan. And as a business executive, I live in uh, 10 countries, including two years in India, in Mumbai, uh, about 10 years ago. We have a very broad topic and, and also a very distinguished panel. So thank you very much for attending this session. And uh, maybe one of our challenge will be to keep uh, the time. So this is why I brought my, my, uh, my um, <clears throat> stopwatch. And uh, I will ask every panelist to introduce herself or himself uh, on, on the, to, to uh, indicate his or her thought about this topic for in about four minutes. And, and if I show you the, if I show you the <laughs> stopwatch, it means that time is nearly up. And then we will try to have some some Q and A and some maybe some some concluding remarks. Yes, again. On ladies first, so I will start with uh, Anno. So Anno, if you could uh, kindly uh, tell more, tell us more about you and about Hello. your thoughts about this uh, topic. Uh, okay, so I'm Anu Bardwaj. I'm the founder of Women Investing in Women Digital and the State of Women Podcast Network. And I have been focusing uh, on women and girls, the advancement of women and girls over the past two decades. And at the moment, I am working on an artificial intelligence based solution, also blockchain. Um, and I am looking at how do we give women who have, and girls who have traditionally not had access to these advanced technologies, especially in countries like India, how do we bridge this digital divide and bring them closer? And I think with what's happened with the pandemic, we've noticed that there are uh, so many people who are not getting access to information. Uh, the disease is spreading, and it's because these people have not had those communication tools as before. What I'm working on now is a solution where we can not only track how information is disseminated, but with the use of artificial intelligence, we can track what areas of the country are getting information and where we need to uh, focus our policies and programs in order to make sure that everybody's on the same page and everybody's health and education is progressing in the same direction. I think in 10 years from now, our topic is our world in 2030. I believe that we're going to make some uh, substantial advances when it comes to um, inclusion of women and girls, financial inclusion, um, health inclusion. These are UN SDGs, as you already all know, like one of the 17 SDGs. And when we put women at the center of the equation when it comes to education, whether it's health or finance, you see a trend where countries are going to progress. I think right now we've identified where these big gaps are, and, and you're noticing it now through all of the data on, on infection rates and so on and so forth. But I think what's happening with all of these different stakeholders who are coming forward with new solu solutions, they are realizing more than ever that women and girls are integral to stopping stopping the spread of the pandemic, but more importantly, that we need to start including them more. So th thank you very much, Anu. You, you have been uh, quite uh, quite on time. It's only uh, two minutes and 25 seconds. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a record. <laughs> um, so maybe if uh, B. Tiagarajan, you could tell us more about you and also about uh, your thought about this important topic. Uh, good evening, Frank. Uh, it's a honor to uh, participate. I'm not Frank. I'm, I'm Philip. I'm a friend of Frank, but uh, Philip. <laughs> yeah, Frank is listening. Thank you, Philip, for moderating this session. Uh, my name is Tiag Rajan. I am Managing Director of uh, Blue Star Limited. Uh, we are a large conditioning and refrigeration firm, 76-year-old uh, company. Um, the uh, we, I live in Mumbai, uh, which is the epicenter now of the uh, pandemic. Um, I I am very optimistic that uh, India and the world will come out of this, and uh, I am also hopeful that after every crisis, 
uh, there is some innovation takes place and the world reinvents itself. Um, I was listening to the other panels uh, in the morning, afternoon, and the panel just you concluded. Uh, I think um, I don't think we will ever have a pandemic. The the solution will be found for every. Uh, virus. That's what I believe. By 2030, the entire world will focus on this particular issue. So I had felt that uh, the G7 or G20 or UN, uh, the topics so far, or terrorism or climate change or inequalities, pandemic as a subject was left out. I think the focus will be on that subject, and the world will come out of this in a big way. And also, my concern is that uh, the uh, trade barriers will intensify. As a practicing business manager, my uh, my important concern is that uh, it is going to be a world uh, which is not going to be experiencing the globalization through which we all benefit. I, I myself, in my career, is a beneficiary of the globalization. I am concerned about that, and I I think extraordinary leadership at all levels will be required in order to overcome. And coming to specifically India, I think it will indeed be the third largest economy in 2030. The most important issue it has to deal with will be the jobs, like with 10 to 12 million people coming into workforce every year. I don't think we have enough jobs to offer. So therefore, how India can focus on infrastructure creation, and also my my favorite topic in CI and other forums is how we reinvent ourselves as the food factory to the world, if not manufacturing. Thank you. You mean food factory or, or what? Food factory to the world. I, I I don't think we can we we can now. In my own view is. Uh, the, you can compete to become a manufacturing uh, a fact, manufacturing hub for the world, but as against this, I, I, I am a proponent of that. We should be the food factory to the world, whether it is fresh produce or whether it is processed food. India should focus its attention on that. With around 65 percent of the population engaged in agriculture, and with the migrant laborers who have gone over to the villages, it is worthwhile to. Capitalize in this moment to transform the rural economy and become a supplier of food to the entire world. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Marcos Vinicius G. Freitas. Uh, could you please tell us a little bit more about you and about uh, your thought about this topic? Uh, well, my name is Marcos Vinicius G. Freitas. I'm from Brazil, but uh, I'm a professor of law and international relations, and I'm currently a visiting professor at Tana Foreign Affairs University. But I'm calling I'm speaking to you from Brazil, where I have been stuck because of COVID-19. I came to Brazil in January for vacation and haven't been able to return, right? But I thought about the topic and uh, it's, you know, bad. Uh, thinking about 10 years ahead is always a complicated thing. But I think that, you know, in that sense, the Chinese can teach us a lot about long-term thinking. And I was dividing, in my thoughts, what are the major challenges that we have and what are some of the positive aspects? As the challenges, I came with a, a, huge, no, a list of 10 items, right? We will have more mouths to feed, and I think I agree the importance of, you know, having a food uh, place that can provide food for the whole world. Because probably the demographics show that we'll have around 8.5 billion new people, people in the world. So what are the challenges that come with that? Well, we need to create more jobs and we need to be creative, right? Because the greatest challenge and the greatest thing that we have found out with COVID-19 is that people do not have conditions to afford their own expenses, right? You know, the amount of savings that we have in the world is so little that people are living from paycheck to paycheck. And the challenge that COVID-19 presents is that that has become a reality. So we know that we have a high level of people indebted and we're not making enough to save and, you know, to keep for a rainy day. Uh, so we need to create more jobs, jobs that pay well, 
so that people can find, you know, uh, meaning for their lives too. One of the greatest challenges also that we have is that there will be more people, around 1 billion people that will be over 65 years of age. And all the healthcare concerns that we have to worry about, right? We'll need to change the way healthcare is done. For many years, you know, healthcare industry has lived out of unhealthy people. So we need to build, you know, more health into the system, right? How do we ensure that people are healthier in the future? And at the international level, we'll see that democracy will be under challenge, right? The whole problem with democracy nowadays is that we elect and then we regret, right? Buyer's remorse, you know, you, you vote and as you leave, you start thinking, why did I vote for this guy? So that's a great challenge that we have to think about, how we renew our democracies in a way that we are happy with the system and not totally complaining all the time. Uh, I think that uh, inequality will rise, and that's a great challenge that we have to face. So these are challenges that we have to understand as we look into 2030 about, you know, how can we address these challenges? What are the positive aspects, I'd say? Well, there is no doubt a shift to Asia, right? The world will be more Asia-centric, uh, the economy and the growth and the technology, everything is taking place in Asia. It's not coming from the West. Actually, COVID-19 has shown how fractured the Western societies have been to address these kind of challenges, right? I can think about South Korea dealing very well, Germany dealing very well, but everyone else has had problems. Well, don't quote New Zealand, right? It's an island, isolated, it's a little different, right? So I think that's an issue. We see that uh, and Asian societies tend to be more, more, you know, collaborative societies and more interdependence. And I think we need to address that. And I think that one of the advantages that we may look into the future is that I believe poverty may be reduced in the coming years. I, I do see that trend and I hope we keep there. So what do we need to do? Well, I think the greatest challenge we have is to secure the gains that we have accumulated over the years, you know, until now. And let us make sure that when we, whenever we make any new improvements, we do not make, uh, we do not deteriorate the gains that societies have built. We need to change the way we do capitalism, right? We need to pay people more, or we need to find ways in which people don't live from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, so that whenever we have challenges, like COVID-19 has presented, we are able to secure a better standard of, life, uh, standard of living. So those are my points, the initial points that I wanted to share with you today. Okay. Obrigado, Marcos. Uh, I see that you have some strong support from your student. There is uh, one called Tremaine who has sent you a message. <laughs> you, you, are, you are the best. You are the best. <laughs> Thank you. I will then uh, maybe we have time to challenge you about this, what you said about the need to have more jobs. Uh, but now uh, I will ask Ben if you could uh, introduce yourself and indicate your thought about this topic. Hi, hi, I'm Ben Banerjee. I'm born in India but grew up in Holland. In the last 10 years, I'm living in Switzerland. I lead the biggest impact investment community in Switzerland, and we are working on increasing the awareness of impact investment in the Swiss financial world. Uh, and also we are investing heavily into emerging countries mainly. That's, the, that's basically the history of impact investment. I assume all of you are aware of the term impact investment. Uh, regarding the flow of events, I have been speaking about this and talking to this many world leaders since more than two decades, including the United States, uh, Russia. And at this moment, I'm advising the Norwegian, Finnish, Hong Kong, and the Faith Invest on their investment policies and investment levels on the macro level, you know, macroeconomic level. Next to that, I'm a member of a couple of global think tanks like the East West Institute, Climate Leadership Coalition and all that. Now, what about the, <laughs> the world in 2030? I think there is, we are standing at a crossroad, really at a crossroad where we are going to choose. I can add to Marcos, I, I think I have opinion about every point regarding Marcos, what he mentioned, some points I agree, some I not, but I'll come to that later. I think by negative, of course, we had had, I don't want to even start with the immense loss of life and the livelihood we had. 
especially in the weaker part of our society, the old, the sick, and the poor. But at, at this moment, I just try to focus on the finance and the investment strategies because the impact will be everywhere. The impact of COVID has shown it will impact our way of working, our lifestyle, traveling, fashion, vacations, even the real estate diversification. So financial, one of the laws we just noticed, especially because a friend of mine, he's the head of the Norwegian uh, sovereign fund, he was saying the loss of equity. There has been a massive, massive loss of equity and added to it the decrease of production. And many of the funds and individuals have at this moment lost their funds or their value. And this is luckily till now, which basically is the positive side of the story. It is very much limited to the old businesses, not to the impact businesses yet. On the other hand, it is also giving the opportunity for some of them who are smart or not smart, I would say, who were fast to, to buy into the depressed equities and the depressed properties. So concrete example, that would be the right one to say. Uh, the Norwegians have been hit, hit very, very badly, especially with the loss of equity and the fall of oil price, but also because they have to disinvest a lot of their assets in the in and depressed market to fill the loss of the government's decrease in income and to fill the government's expenditure. And this has made them aware that they have to be better prepared for this kind of events so that next time when COVID-20 and COVID-21 comes or any other issues, especially with the climate change, that they are not impacted by that at all. So conclusion, I would say that there's a massive amount of global funds which is now moving more and more into impact investment and COVID seems to have accelerated it, in my opinion. Uh, we were, before the COVID, we were at around 500 billion uh, in impact investment. At this moment, the number I heard, it's already 830 billion plus. So that will be the cost of the estimation. And the investment strategy is the second point where I would say that a lot of asset managers in Switzerland, they were just selling, selling, selling when the COVID hit them. So this is going to clean up the market. I sincerely hope this is going to clean up the market. There are people, there are the old traditional asset managers who will stick to their old strategies, but I, I don't expect them to have much uh, future anymore because of how the market is changing and how the client mentality is changing. We are now in the new era. So in that way, I'm very positive about the impact that we are having and the world 2030. But like I mentioned, we are standing at a crossroad. We are standing where we have to choose which direction we go to. Do we go back to the pre-COVID or, or do we go to a new world where we keep in consideration the impacts and we learn from what has happened now? So I, I'll try to keep limited till there at this moment. And just last example is if you look at the disinvest invest, uh, investments, Saudi Arabia already started before the COVID. Uh, the Rockefeller started before the COVID and many of them have started now to disinvest from many of the old structural businesses and invest further into things like circular economy and the right businesses. And many of the things which uh, I think I'm not always in a favor of globalization that many of the buildings which China is doing like the coal power stations all over the world, these countries are going to end up with a lot of stranded assets. So I think the new world will see a lot of this old business ending up as stranded assets. So that's what, from the financial point of view, from being from Switzerland. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, now I will ask uh, Sadhguru, if I may call you like this, <laughs> if you could tell us about you. And, and also about what you think about this topic. Namaste, everyone. Namaste. All the over here. And uh, I am Swami Brahmesh Anandacharya Swamiji. I am the spiritual, I am the head of uh, our organization, International Sadhguru Foundation. And uh, I am a spiritual leader. Nice meeting you all today. The world is going through an incredible changes and uh, it is predicted that we will see more and more issues and problems with regards to gro global economy. I would suggest country like India need to develop their industrialization, industries need to go and uh, slowly, slowly authorities or the government need to boost citizens to be self-sufficient and self-reliant. 
because countries like india have so much talent and that has to be pushed because people are not that afraid of the conditions like covid 19 etc but talent when it comes to talent and it is not getting a good opportunity and nothing is been supported for the uh, citizen that makes a main, main problem and uh, what i feel is next decade will be coming and india will be at the age of growing growing and growing so what i feel is industrial revolution should come it should be in cities also and it will be in uh, urban areas also and this will be the start the self uh, reliable reliant um, situation for my country like india will be the using this opportunity and best perspective now it is coming on and secondly technology digitalization all these things will change the system of education now classrooms will be uh, more bigger than what we use now using now so education will be totally changed and uh, students thinking students thinking in a way of living life will be something different in next decade so with regards to world in 2030 i would suggest uh, there will be more and more uh, natural calamities which we have to think on because nowadays we will be starting using more and more power to gain economy at the same time industries will go and other way there has to have bigger task to maintain the natural uh, natural resources or nature and this is what i have to share with you uh, just now time being thank you very much thank you very much sir guru um <clears throat> but by the name you name sad guru it mean yeah, sad, sad in english it is it is an english name sad or is it not it has another meaning in uh, it's in sanskrit english. name sanskrit what does it what does it mean sad in sanskrit sad sad, sad guru is a great teacher i see i see a great okay. so it's not the english term i see no no okay <laughs> Um so so now uh, Sonu would you like to um tell us about you and about your thinking about this topic Thank you Th- thank you Philip um it's a pleasure to be here Th- thanks thanks very much so so firstly a little bit about myself um I'm the guardian of the culture uh, founder and CEO of um Seneva our focus is on a resort um and um um our, our core purpose is Ima- engaging in imaginative slow life um i believe the big business success comes when you can take contact concepts that are traditionally opposite uh traditionally people would say well if it's if it's sustainable it can't be luxurious or if it's luxurious it can't be good for you but so neighbor luxury luxury wellness and sustainability are not opposite they go hand in hand they feed off each other and um in a way the more more sustainable we are the more luxurious we we we, we get So um we offer our guests luxuries while whilst minimizing our impact on the planet and enhancing their health. How do we do that? We do that by questioning and challenging what really is the luxury today in the 21st century um because it's a word that's been misused and um you know the the rich are now urban living in cities so a lot of what the wealthy took for granted in the past is now rare because that's essentially what luxury is about something that's new but also true to you that rings a chord in your heart. and hence our brand proposition of inspiring a lifetime of rare experiences uh whether it's walking on the beach barefoot or having a salad that was plucked from the garden that morning um or watching uh the moon through one of the largest telescopes in the indian ocean or in thailand uh with someone like buzz aldrin the second man on the moon uh explaining to you that there's a universe out there um my wife and i have um you know always um right from the outset of setting up our company have believed that a company must have a purpose beyond just enriching shareholders like um my wife and i and our partners and paying employees a salary and when you can do that it can be very meaningful um a few years ago back in 2008 uh we set up the Seneva Foundation um which um uh has been funded by based on another belief it's had about 10 million dollars 
go through its bank account. It's a it's a it's a UK charity, and uh, we've pay, we've made no donations. So the key to it is my wife and I have not do- donated a penny. My my um, our guests have not donated. Uh, the money that's been raised has been through changes to the way we do business because I believe that um, uh, governments can create the context, but it's companies that really need to um, make changes uh, to to the way they do business to try and solve some of these uh, big challenges that we have in the 21st century that some of the other um, speakers alluded to. Um, and um, I'll, I'll give you two examples of what we did, and then I'll, I'll go on to um, my, my thoughts on, on this subject. So uh, back in 2008, um, the World Travel and Tourism Council gave us their Tourism for Tomorrow Award, which is the equivalent of the Oscars for sustainability in travel and tourism. The WTTC is the, the main uh, government private sector partnership and, um, you know, we won it again in 2015. But we decided in 2008 at that point to follow their carbon calculator. It's a calculator, they, a device for the industry. But then we found out it was inadequate because we discovered that only um, uh, 15% of our CO2 emissions were measured by um, the WTTC's uh, carbon calculator, um, which was... Um, uh, what happens on site, scopes one and two. Scope three, which is the externalities, wasn't measured, uh, whether it's guests flying in, supplies coming in, what, depending on what you serve. You know, the difference with the carbon footprint on a fish compared with an Argentinian beef, where there's deforestation involved or an Australian Wagyu was completely different. So 85% wasn't being measured by us uh, at the time and the industry. So we decided to measure that. And we, we also decided to introduce a mandatory carbon levy. Um, no pushback from our guests. We just added 2% onto our, our bill. Um, no negative perception from them. And in fact, if anything, it improved um, uh, our, our, their perception of us, but raised a lot of capital for good causes. Um, it, it funded a 1.5 megawatt windmill in India, um, half a million trees in Thailand, giving the um, giving the, the local community um, 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 support and work. And then in Darfur in Myanmar, the cook stove. Um, uh, Four million people die a year of lung asphyxiation. These cook stoves avoid that smoke. Um, they also burn half the wood. So in Darfur, uh, people are risking the security of their villages just to find the firewood. And in Myanmar, some families of the projects we support are spending up to 30% of their income on firewood. So half the consumption and then a 60% reduction in CO2 emissions. So a perfect example where we made a small change to the way we do business. No negative feedback from our guests did not affect our profitability. Another one is we decided to ban branded water on our hotels back in 2008. So no Evian, no Vitel, just water bottled on site. And apart from the obvious ecological benefits, um, we found there was a financial saving. We saved 18% of our water revenue. So instead of spending 20% of our water revenues for that bottle of Evian, Vitel or Badois, it went down to 2%. Um, That 18% gave 800,000 people access to clean water. So another example where small hotel company, we had six senses at the time as well uh, as part of our group um, contributing before I sold that in 2012, um, you know, had, had a huge impact for people well beyond our shores. So it gives you a bit of an idea of Suneva, our values, our philosophy, uh, what we're about and why we won these Oscars for not just luxury and travel and tourism, but also sustainability. So in, in terms of this subject, um, you know, how will people get our, our, their power? Uh, we have to go towards solar. So, I mean, you know, this uh, COVID crisis um, has been like other crises. And in a way, whilst we, it's been very troubling the last three months, um, at the end, we have always, uh, having gone through many crises uh, in my career, and most of you have gone through many crises in your careers as well, we, we saw an end. We knew that there was going to be an end to it. Um, and that, that reassured us. Um, Unfortunately, um, with global warming, um, it's a crisis that will never end. It'll just get worse and worse and worse, um, as we've seen. You know, as we go beyond, um, you know, even even with the Paris Agreement commitments of two degrees, that would mean the Amazon being uh, destroyed, undermined. Uh, it's just too hot for the Amazon. Most of the coral in environments where we operate our resorts would have been obliterated, would, would be obliterated at two degrees. And the world's governments came back the year after saying that, um, with all their commitments, the best they could get to is two and a half degrees. And with feedback loops, once you get to two and a half degrees, four degrees is on the way uh, and further. So, you know, the likelihood of four degrees and most of India being uninhabitable um, in, in that, you know, not un- inhabitable in, in a non-climate controlled environment, um, it, it will be a reality. So um, the, 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 uh, the hottest days we get today in India 
will happen during our coolest days today. You know, what, what the temperature we get in December um, in, in 2020 to 2100 will be like it is um, it, today in the hot summers. So uh, so we've got to look at alternatives there, and especially as countries grow and you have um, huge demand for growth uh, from China, India. Um, and, and the irony of all is um, that solar is there. Um, and in, in these uh, sunny climates, solar is cheaper. It's, it's beaten grid parity. So it's, um, it's, for example, in the Maldives, our solar power costs us 13 cents and 11 cents with power purchase agreements. The 13 cents is with battery backup. 11 cents is just the solar panels. And our diesel is costing us 20 cents. So solar is cheaper. It's there. The technology is available globally, but uh, we just need to change our ways. I think that's the problem with um, human beings is we get into habits. It takes 20 days to create a habit and um, it takes more than 20 days to break it. Now, I think the advantage of COVID is that to some extent, uh, to talk about what Ben was, uh, ben was saying um, and about how um, you know we need to look at COVID as an example to lead us to a a better future, um, this habit has been broken. The habit of our daily lives have been broken and we've learned new habits. And fortunately, some of those new habits have actually been very positive. Um, you know, just this factor of webinars, you know, normally I would have flown all the way to Delhi to see all of you. It'd be nice to have been together with all of you, but we have saved a lot of CO2 by doing what we're doing now. And I found that in my, my business as well. So my travel schedule will halve, my business travel schedule will halve next year without affecting my business effectiveness. So um, we've broken habits and I think we just need to ensure we don't go back to, uh, we don't want to fix the leg. We want to cast a, a new leg. Um, so that's on, on solar. I think in terms of food, what will we eat? I think we've got to go towards vegan, um, a vegan and plant-based food. Um, it's not just um, good for the planet. Uh, we know that the cow, the cow accounts for 20%. I'm sorry for referring to the cow in that way uh, to some of our Indian guests um, here, but uh, we know that the cow accounts for 20% of greenhouse gases. Um, after the built environment, it is the biggest contributor. So um, we've, we've, we've got to wean ourselves away from dairy and red meat. It's also not healthy for you. I've, I, I had stage four cancer in 2018. I cured myself through a combination of chemo and alternatives. And um, I read a lot about radical remissions. And one of the things they all had in common was no beef, no dairy, no white flour, no sugar. And beef and dairy were two things. So, so I think a healthier eating style will also be healthier for the environment. They go hand in hand. And so, you know, um, health and sustainability will be important if we want to live long lives, if we want to. And also, we know that beef undermines your immune system. So in an era of, of pandemics, um, eating red meat lowers your immune system. People on plant-based diet have a better chance of overcoming um, uh, viruses. And the irony of COVID is it's been much less virulent than other viruses. And um, I think if a majority of the world had been more plant-based, had built up their immune system, that would have helped a lot. So in terms of what we'll eat, um, and then, um, sorry, sorry, Sonu, I think that may maybe we come back, but uh, sure, sure, we absolutely. also have to, to, to um, yeah, we'll ask, okay, uh, right. last but not least, um, Anshu Gupta, if you can tell us more about you and about what you think about this big topic. Hi, <coughs> hello. Yes. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm from India and we run this uh, large institution now called Goonj, which is eco of voice, it's a Hindi word. Uh, a lot of people call it uh, a large social enterprise and the other extreme of people uh, call it a larger and a bigger social movement. So it's just interesting that how uh, social enterprise and movement, it's a mix of that. And the whole idea has been for the last two decades now that how do we treat the uh, secondhand material, or uh, reusable material of the cities as a, as a resource? How do we move it out of charity? Because at the end of the day, charity kills dignity. Uh, so how do we dignify the giving? So the simple model is that there's hundreds and thousands of tons of uh, material, second-hand material, cloth, utensil, footwear, furniture, whatever, whatever. It goes to the villages of India and uh, that is where the village communities participate in their own work. They make roads, they make bridges, they clean water bodies. And then instead of money, for some time, they actually receive in kind. So it's like a, it's like a revival of the barter economy. It's like revival of India's biggest strength falls from the or, the or the community work with two new currencies, uh, the, the urban surplus and the, and the rural skills. Uh, 
my opinion on the on the subject to be honest, yeah, honest uh, it's, uh, it's nice that we are we are talking about 10 years ahead where we don't even know that what is going to happen in the next year uh, and it's good that we are at least futuristic and we're talking about it but i've been telling everyone you know in all these webinars and all that till the time people like us uh, the opinion leaders the the people who participates in conferences, seminars, and make policies till the time we understand and accept that we miserably failed somewhere, we will only and only actually build up another dark world. And that's extremely, extremely important for all of us to understand because it is a time when we understand that a large part of the humanity failed, large part of the best possible health systems failed, the fanciest airports failed to stop the virus at the at the source itself. And till the time we really, really, uh, you know, shun our arrogance and say that something fundamentally went wrong, I can tell you that nothing good we will be able to make it. I mean, this is a time when we really talk about SDG, SDGs all over again. How can we chase the same SDGs which we actually decided before uh, pandemic? Why it is important now for us, uh, you know, to to value more, you know, in terms of farmers than the food. How do we value more in terms of say to the the villages of our world, especially in a country like India? I mean, if if on a lockdown, hundreds and thousands of people walk, start walking back to the villages, do we understand that it's a deficit of trust? Somewhere the biggest possible buildings didn't work well. The biggest possible contractors, employers, governments didn't work well because there is a deficit of trust. That's why people wanted to go back to the roots. Uh, so I see a bright future for sure because all of us have to see that. All of us have to aim that. But I, I, I would say that it's extremely important to uh, really correct the way we are approaching it. Uh, sit together and accept and and try to make a list of things that what went wrong, how come things didn't work when this sudden pandemic happened and all our projections, all our figures, all our future planning is actually gone for a toss. And if we are still talking in the same language, same, you know, same way, the way we do not give dignity to the people, we call someone a donor, someone a beneficiary. If we use the same language, same lenses, I don't think we can see a bright future. And then to be honest, many people do not want to hear this, but I think COVID has, uh, brought all of us on a on a platform it threatened all of us uh, people like us are privileged i know because i have been i have seen this journey myself uh, to be honest it's a, it's a beautiful uh, forum today uh, because uh, after 26 days of handling covid myself i'm out and speaking and i know my privilege is that at least i had the best possible doctor on call i i had a separate room for myself but when we talk about millions and millions of people who are going through the same case, there is something fundamentally, you know, is this gone wrong for them? So it's time to really talk about dignity of people. It's time to value more the farm products than the factory products. You know, as, as my fellow speaker also said from India, it's, it's time to value the, you know, the humanity and the, and the common citizen of this country. It's time to change the language. And then we can certainly, certainly, you know, see a see a much brighter future and 10 years hence i think it's extremely important one last point that the time should come when people from the villages do not migrate you know by compulsion i am a migrated person from a smaller beautiful town to the city of delhi but i didn't migrate by compulsion i migrated by choice many of you migrated to various countries and cities by choice so till the time we make a country or a world where Rural population do not migrate by compulsion. They migrate by choice. There will be a major gap, uh, whether it is five years or 10 years, whatever time we fix. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anshu. Um, actually, I have a question for, for Sadhguru. Uh, you, you mentioned that um, you, you think India should be more self-sufficient, self-reliant. And I think that traditionally, India, like many countries, has been very self-sufficient, self-reliant. And actually, the reason why myself, I live in India for two years, 
He said at some time the, the, the country opened up. And as, as a foreign investor, it was possible to invest. So I, I worked for a company called Schiller, Schiller Elevator. I managed this company for two years. But we entered the market because India opened up to, to foreign investors. So do you think that it was better before now that India should go back to the former policy of being uh, much more close to, to foreign investment? Um, there are more chances when it comes to uh, India because the, now China is uh, going with uh, different strategies and whole world is going against China also. So it is great opportunity to India also to invest uh, whatever possible way. And secondly, foreign uh, people will be investing or foreign uh, countries uh, industries will come that is not a big problem but uh, uh, surviving self uh, reliant people of uh, our own uh, people has to come up with new new industries new new goals we have to attain so what i feel is both the way we have to work for investors should invest in india and also indians should have start their own things in india thank you sadguru uh, I have also a quick question to Ben because I see that time will be up in three minutes on 20 seconds. I, I, I meet on a regular basis somebody called Bertrand Picard in Switzerland, who, who is somebody who, who made a, a, a trip around the globe with a balloon and then with a solar plane. And his point is that um, if people who pollute have to pay for it, circular economy will be today very profitable, more profitable than the normal economy. But when you start to tax people who pollute, like in France, you have enormous problem. You have this uh, uh, yellow yellow uh, vest, um, people in the street. So w what is your thinking about this, this way of, of uh, taxing people who pollute? I, I agree to it. I agree to taxing, but uh, the thing is, we have to remember two things. One is the carbon footprint, what I think one of the speakers mentioned, the carbon footprint of food production. That's a very, very real value. We don't pay, the, we don't know the real valuation of the food, what we are paying for. So yes, I believe in this taxation, but also the capit if for the capitalism to work, we need to have the real valuation. And secondly, please don't forget the hidden subsidies that we are in our Western community countries, but also in India and many other countries, you have a lot of hidden subsidies, especially in the petrochemical sector. If you remove these and try to compensate it with the tax that the polluters are paying, it, it really comes up very much positive. Thank you very much, Ben. So I think that time is uh, nearly, nearly up. So I would like to, to thank all of you for participating so actively. It was a real pleasure to, to meet you, even uh, only virtually. And probably we'll have a chance to meet face-to-face, uh, -face, maybe in another Horasis meeting uh, somewhere in the world. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.